see the screen here. Looks good. Awesome. Uh, thanks, thanks so much, Mark, and uh, thanks so much to um, all the organizers. I've I've been having just the best time uh, so far, and uh, I'm very excited for the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so yeah, I am currently at uh, KITP, uh, though next fall uh, I will be going back to um, Hebrew University in uh, Jerusalem to begin a, a faculty position there. Um, and it's my uh, great pleasure to tell you a bit about uh, work that, that us and several others um, have been doing in the last several years, studying the physics of the uh, cold streams that we think feed uh, the most massive galaxies at high redshift and specifically the uh, interaction of these streams with the uh, um, ambient hot circumgalactic medium uh, in these halos. And I want to begin with just a bit of kind of, um, you know, con context by, by what we mean by these cold streams. This came up a little bit during the discussion um, following yesterday's keynote uh, talk. So this is an image from a cosmological simulation of kind of uh, two very massive halos, five times 10 to the 12 solar masses at redshift, uh, you know, two. This snapshot at Z of um, um, four, and what you can see here is basically all the components of the cosmic web and how galaxies form within the cosmic web. So what you're looking at um, are two orthogonal um, um, projections of a large scale cosmic sh uh, sheet, seen edge on on the left and face on on the right. Within the cosmic sheet, you can see by eye several very prominent, dense, elongated intergalactic filaments uh, that are all coplanar. And all the black circles are uh, every dark matter halo in the simulation that has a virial mass above 10 to the 9 solar masses. You can see that uh, for the most part, they tend to lie along the filaments, along an individual filament. Uh, except for the three or several most massive halos, which lie at the nodes of uh, several cosmic filaments and are therefore fed um, from the intergalactic medium in a non-isotropic way from a few discrete um, um, directions. And once these um, intergalactic filaments actually penetrate the virial radius and begin to supply gas within our veer down toward the galaxy, we would commonly refer to them as cold streams or cold accretion streams. Now, kind of as a rule of thumb, what galaxies do we expect to be fed by these a few discrete cold streams as opposed to galaxies lying along a given filament? A good um, rule of thumb, which kind of goes back to Deckel and Bernboy Mo6, is that it's a two sigma peak in the cosmic um, um, density field. So you can see here that's basically demarcated by the black line, whereas all the colored lines are uh, average mass tracks for halos of different masses at redshift zero. So for example, at redshift zero, you really only expect very massive groups or clusters to be stream fed. At redshift of about um, you know two, you expect any halo above 10 to 12 solar masses uh, to be stream fed. <laughs> you would expect a Milky Way progenitor to perhaps have been stream fed at redshift four or greater, and it's quite plausible that even uh, low mass dwarf galaxies, if you go back far enough in time to redshift six or above, they were likely also stream fed lying at the nodes of the cosmic web in this fashion. So this is indeed a phase that we think um, almost every galaxy uh, went through at some point uh, during their um, ev evolution. Now what happens when these intergalactic filaments actually do make it all the way toward the galaxy? I'm gonna show you now a movie, uh, um, showing the evolution from redshift six to redshift uh, four of kind of a massive star forming um, galaxy from the cosmological simulation. This has a halo mass of two times 10 to the 11 solar masses at redshift six. And this is fed by three streams, which in this case, at least, seem to actually make it all the way toward the central galaxy, although we'll discuss that uh, in a lot more de de detail. You can see here the three streams, which are all coplanar, seem to be spinning up the galaxy, supplying the, the galaxy not only with additional gas to fuel star formation, but allowing it to grow its um, angular momentum in a coherent way. And there's been a lot of work written about how cold stream accretion helps galaxies grow in terms of their um, angular momentum. Uh, you'll also notice that as the streams hit the disk, they seem to drive a lot of turbulence in the disk and, and uh, put, put, puts this galaxy in a state of what we call violent disk instability, where you have lots of dense clumps uh, um, um, forming due to strong turbulent motions. So it's quite clear that the streams are if they make it all the way toward the galaxy, they're going to be very important in setting the gas content of galaxies, the angular momentum content of galaxies, and the turbulent content of galaxies. 
Uh, you may have noticed that here the streams seem to have disappeared by the end. The only reason that they seem to have disappeared is that the um, um, there are really two reasons. The interaction region where the streams seem to mix and join the galaxy has grown to beyond the scale of the plot, which is set here at a fixed plus or minus 20 kiloparsec. And also the plane of the streams is not always aligned with the plane of the central galaxy. And since the plane of the image is here focused on the plane of the central galaxy, if the stream plane has been slightly tilted with respect to that plane, that would also make the stream seem to have gone away. Now that kinematic signature of streams flowing in, as we saw, and inspiring toward the central galaxy, there are suggestions uh, in uh, ob observations of the CGM of very massive galaxies at high redshift that seem to be at least consistent with that picture. And I'm showing here some uh, um, results from a work by Chris Martin using the um, um, KCWI looking at Lyman Alpha emission of halos of a few times 10 to the 12 solar masses at redshift 2 to 3. <laughs> and you can see this large scale kind of 100 kiloparsec um, rotation signal or at least shearing motion signal in the Lyman alpha emission of the halo and there's been a lot of work done um, also some work in ab absorption about how these kinematic signatures are at least seem to be consistent with the image of in spiraling um, cold streams from the virial scales down toward the central galaxy however uh, the thought that these streams are able to actually make it all the way down toward the central galaxy, especially in very massive halos, which we've heard a lot this week. We expect to have a stable hot phase, a stable accretion shock at the virial temperature. It's not at all clear that streams can actually make it all the way down toward the central galaxy. And, and indeed, they may very well break up or be disintegrated due to hydrothermal or gravitational instabilities, due to shocks or collisions between streams in the central, what we call kind of like the messy region or the interaction region, which uh, um, is typically a sphere of order 30 to 50 percent of the virial radius. And um, there's been a lot of work using different cosmological simulations that produce different results about uh, how far into the halo the streams are actually able to um, p p penetrate. And similar to everything else that we've been hearing about the small scale structure in the CGM, cosmological simulations are not really the best tool to use to study this because the resolution that they achieve out near the halo is really quite bad, only of order 10 or 20 cells per stream diameter. So we can't really use them to model the detailed physics of the evolution and the interaction of streams with the CGM. And in addition to the general question of how deeply into halos do streams reach and how much can they supply galaxies with gas and angular uh, momentum, we mentioned the Lyman alpha em emission in the halos. And one very interesting question is, uh, could that be directly due to the dissipation of gravitational e energy of streams as they flow from the virial radius down toward the central galaxy? it was been hypothesized that the gravitational energy gained by streams as they flow down the potential well uh, would be enough to basically power the giant Lyman Alpha Nebula or giant Lyman Alpha blobs that are so commonly observed around these galaxies at high redshift. However, the details of that um, dissipation uh, are not exactly clear, nor how it would depend on other halo properties or if indeed this could even work. Um, so those are really, I would say, the two big main uh, motivations for studying the interaction of uh, streams with the hot ambient CGM, which uh, leads to the following cartoon of Kelvin Helmholtz and stability in streams. So imagine that we have a hot um, virial halo with a temperature of order 10 to the 6 Kelvin, streams that are of order uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and if we assume that the streams in the halo are in approximate pressure equilibrium, that leads to the first of several dimensionless numbers that define the system. In this case, the density contrast between the stream and the background, which we'll get back to the, back to the numbers in just a moment. The second dimensionless number uh, defining the system is the Mach number, which is the speed of the stream divided by the sound speed in the halo. And since the virial velocity is of order the sound speed of gas at the virial temperature, the Mach number of the stream with respect to the halo is of order unity, which implies that the stream is going to be very supersonic with respect to itself, with Mach numbers in excess of, uh, of, of, of 10. <laughs> and the third dimensionless number that defines the system with only the physics we've talked about so far, only hydrodynamics and cosmology, is the stream radius divided by the virial radius, which is another way of saying the sound crossing time of the stream divided by the virial crossing time of the stream, the time it takes it to make into the galactic disk. 
Uh, now, all these parameters can be constrained by cosmology. And in fact, just to reiterate, if you assume that the halo is at approximately the virial temperature, the streams are at approximately 10 to the 4, and you have approximate pressure equilibrium between stream and the hot halo, you can derive the density contrast as a function of the Mach number and, and, uh, and the redshift. If you then take this density contrast and you have a model for the halo density near r -vir, and a free parameter of what the hot gas mass fraction at our veer would be, you can actually derive the mean volume density in the streams, again, as a function of halo mass and redshift. And then once you know what this actual volume density is, assume that the streams are flowing at roughly the virial velocity, and we know the accretion rate onto dark matter halos from cosmology, if you have uh, an assumption of what fraction of the secretion is along a given stream, you can constrain this R stream divided by R veer. And for example, for 3 times 10 to the 12 solar mass halo at redshift 2, you expect uh, stream densities of order um, 10 to the minus 2 hydrogen atoms per cubic centimeter, which is quite high for what we usually think of as the CGM, and R stream over R veer of order 10%. Now, what does this imply for the stability of these streams or, the, or their evolution? You can actually derive, using standard linear an, an analysis, the dispersion relation for the Kelvin-Helmholtz instability as the stream shears with the ambient CGM. And what I'm plotting here uh, as a function of these three-dimensionalist numbers, density contrast, the Mach number, and the radius of the stream compared to the virial radius, the number of E-foldings of growth in the linear uh, re regime within a virial crossing time. And the two takeaways from this plot are, n n number one, for a large uh, region of the expected parameter space. These streams should be highly nonlinear. kelvin helmholtz instability has a lot of time to grow. And number two, which is somewhat interesting, you'll notice that there seems to be kind of a phase transition in the dispersion relation going from very fast growth to somewhat slower growth. That has to do with an interesting transition in kelvin helmholtz instability in general going from what are known as um, surface modes, which are what we all study in our fluid mechanics classes uh, and are indeed caused by the shearing of two independent surfaces um, compared to the body mode. So at high Mach numbers, these kelvin helmholtz rolls actually stable out due to the strong shear. But what is, becomes actually destabilized are sound waves reverberating basically back and forth between the two sides of the stream. And due to constructive interference, growing the density and the pressure perturbations from the inside uh, out. And just to give you a sense of what that would look like, because I think these movies are fun. What does Kelvin Helmholtz look like in a three-dimensional cylinder? <laughs> so this is uh, the evolution of a surface mode that has a density contrast of 10 and a Mach number of 1. And this is kind of what we're all used to thinking of, I think, when we think about Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. The two sides of the stream here act um, in independently of each other. But all you do is up the Mach number to 2. Those modes are stabilized at this point. And the way the instability grows instead is, again, through these sound waves reverberating back and forth in the stream, growing kind of a pattern of uh, density and pressure from the inside out. And we, we know how to, how to model all of the different um, uh, growth rates. So that was just the linear regime. We already said, well, Kelvin Helmholtz is going to be highly nonlinear. So what is the final nonlinear disruption of streams? Uh, actually look like? Well, that looks a little different in the surface mode regime versus the body mode regime. In the surface mode regime, you grow those Kelvin Helmholtz eddies rolls um, from each you know, surface, and they begin to slowly devour the stream from the outside in through what can be modeled as kind of a diffusion process. And you can model that um, analytically. Obviously, it scales as the stream crossing time. It's going to be shorter the narrower the stream is. The body modes behave a little differently. What you actually wind up doing <coughs> is developing a very long wavelength sinusoidal perturbation across the entire stream. That typically has a wavelength of order 10 times the thickness of the stream. And that eventually leads to very rapid uh, generation of uh, um, turbulence and vorticity and disruption of the stream in, in a time scale that also will scale as the sound crossing time of the stream. So in actually both cases, um, the nonlinear stream disruption will be shorter for narrower streams. And this allows us to develop the largest stream, uh, which is normalized by the virial radius, that will be completely nonlinearly disrupted in less than the virial crossing time. And again, depending on our two-dimensionalist numbers, density contrast and the Mach number, <laughs> that can, can change. But as a take-home message, I would say if a stream is narrower than 5% of the virial radius, we expect it to be completely shredded and destroyed in the CGM through hydrodynamic uh, instabilities. However, I haven't talked about any other physics. What happens if we add cooling? 
Well, as we've heard a lot about uh, in the first few uh, weeks, through all the great work that's been done by uh, all our friends, Max and Peng, uh, Su Ching, Drummond, uh, M M Martin Vickery, about the cloud crushing problem, once you add cooling to the mix, uh, you have to think about a fourth dimensionless number, which can be thought of in this case as the ratio of the shearing time scale, so the non-radiative shear layer uh, growth time, to the cooling time in the mixing region, which can be translated to a stream radius divided by a critical stream radius. And for cosmological streams, if I use the same like, model that we introduced at the beginning to plot this uh, actual um, r r ratio as a function of halo mass and redshift, you'll learn that cooling is predicted to prevent stream disruption by kelvin helmholtz instability. This ratio is almost always expected to be larger than one. Now, in practice, what does that look like? In the no cooling case, what you're, I'm showing here are results from two simulations of just a passive scalar to trace the mixing of the fluids. In the case with like no cooling, you see that the stream tends to fling material out into the background, tends to pollute the CGM with stream material, whilst the core of the stream remains relatively unmixed. With cooling, with strong cooling, uh, you see that uh, that is not what happens. The stream remains very, uh, very collimated, and actually a lot of the background material has been entrained onto the stream and is really m mixed very efficiently into the core of the stream. If you change this into the slow cooling uh, re regime, then I would hope you agree it looks very similar to the no cooling regime, where all that was done here is changing the cooling times. Um, you can see the same thing in the density. So with, you know, um, I'm out cooling, the stream density becomes very diluted um, as it flings material out into the CGM, whereas with cooling, the stream can remain very dense, uh, well mixed, and very collimated. And with slow cooling, again, you seem much more similar to the case without any cooling. Uh, you can actually model the mass entrainment uh, using similar models to what we've heard about uh, for, due to the cloud crushing problem. Um, and you can uh, ask, well, by how much can the stream mass grow um, in the CGM? And it can actually grow by, by about a factor of uh, two or three, and the simulations seem to match the analytical uh, predictions for how this entrainment uh, occurs through these turbulent uh, mixing layers. Now, as the stream entrains material, it slows down. This is kind of the opposite question of accelerating a cold cloud in a hot wind. So now we want to decelerate a cold stream in a hot CGM by allowing it to entrain material. Uh, and that's just due to conservation of um, um, momentum. And indeed, the, and, uh, we have an, uh, you can derive an analytical uh, pr prediction for how the stream should slow down uh, as, a function of, you know, uh, as, as a function of time. That leads to dissipation of kinetic energy of the stream. And it also leads to dissipation of thermal energy from the background as the background cools and condenses onto the stream. Uh, so uh, you can put all of those and uh, uh, elements of the problem of the problem together: dissipation of kinetic energy from the stream, dissipation of thermal energy from the background, and also include generation of turbulence in the stream and slightly heating up of the stream. Both of those turn out to be a, somewhat negligible. And you can do the bookkeeping of all the energy generation and um, um, di um, dissipation in the simulation. That's what's shown on the le in kind of the left panel. And then the right panel is what the cooling function uh, of the streams in the ambient CGM would give you at any given uh, like time step. And the fact that the left-hand panel and the center panel agree with each other means that all the dissipation mechanisms, which we know how to model and are just due to this Kelvin-Helmholtz plus cooling interaction, um, are exactly what is fueling the cooling and the radiation. So we now know how to model that. And if you look at the distribution uh, in terms of the temperatures, it turns out that most of that emission will be emitted in the Lyman alpha through a thin layer uh, around the interface between the stream and the background, exactly through that radiatively cooling turbulent mixing layer. <laughs> uh, and then if you assume that we now have a stream in the, in, in the gravitational potential of a dark matter halo, so it's accelerating toward the center of the halo, there's a density profile and a pressure profile both in the hot gas and in the cold stream, uh, and also the stream is becoming somewhat like narrower as it approaches the center of the halo. It's no longer a cylinder, but it's being kind of uh, pushed into a, in, in, into a conical shape but that locally at every given halocentric radius, the models for kinetic energy dissipation and thermal energy dissipation that we derived uh, for the uniform case can be applied, you can uh, basically uh, derive quantities such as this. The velocity at 0.1 RV are normalized by the virial uh, velocity. 
the function of halo mass and redshift, the, uh, by how much the stream mass has grown as a function of halo mass and redshift, and in, most importantly, how much lime and alpha luminosity has been em em emitted in the halo as a function of halo mass and redshift. The upshot being that between 10 to 42 to 10 to 44 ergs per second can be released from streams uh, in the halo just due to this interaction between streams uh, and the circumgalactic medium. Um, which seems to be uh, able to explain uh, the at least low and intermediate luminosity um, Lyman alpha blobs. Uh, I'm going to skip this discussion of um, 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 oxygen-6 in the mixing layers in the interest of time, but I'd be happy to come back to it during the discussion if there's any um, interest. And in the last uh, two minutes, if I may, I just want to say a little bit about self-gravity. Uh, streams can be modeled as self-gravitating isothermal cylinders and uh, the thing about a self-gravitating isothermal cylinder is that it has a maximal mass per unit length that it can uh, that it can have before hydrostatic equilibrium is no longer possible. It's basically the equivalent of the genes mass, but for a cylinder instead of a sphere. <laughs> um, and and this was given by Jerry Ostreicher, uh, um, 1964. It depends only on the temperature of the stream through the sound speed. And if you draw this. Uh, our, our fifth dimensionless number now, the ratio of the mass per unit length of the stream to this like maximal mass per unit length for hydrostatic equilibrium, you learn that for a large uh, um, region of the parameter space, this should be larger than uh, we should be should be larger than one. <laughs> now, in the star formation community, we know that star formation in giant molecular clouds happens along filaments, and if any of those filaments has this mu parameter larger than one, that implies, okay, we know that filament should be forming stars due to gravitational instability. This would seem to be a prediction that cosmic streams in the CGM might be actually star forming. And this seems to be seen in certain simulations. So this is the same simulation that I showed you the movie of a few, uh, a few moments ago. And you can see here the dark matter, the gas, and stars that are younger than 100 million years, which is indicative of star formation. And we're highlighting here two very dense clumps of gas that seem to be forming stars, but are not associated with any substructure in the dark matter. And this seems to be consistent with the predictions of stream instability uh, due to um, gravitational instability, and, and we actually discussed that this might have some interesting implications for formation of metal pore globular clusters. Uh, I also want to highlight this uh, really awesome recent paper by Jake Bennett and uh, Deborah C. Jockey, who developed kind of a new and very fancy method to get enhanced spatial uh, re refinement on streams in their simulation, and they also found that as they increased the spatial resolution, they found more and more star formation outside of galaxies in streams. And this, again, might be indicative of this mu larger than one uh, stream, which, which should require some uh, f further study. <laughs> um, uh, the, and in cases where, the gravi where this mu parameter is less than one, so you actually can begin in hydrostatic uh, equilibrium, um, but you still have now uh, gravitational instability versus shearing instability of the kelvin helmholtz instability, um, even if a cylinder has mu less than one and it can begin in hydrostatic equilibrium, that's an equilibrium configuration. It's not a stable equilibrium configuration. It's still a lower energy state for the stream to fragment into discrete spherical clumps. And the question is, what is going to win? Fragmentation into discrete spherical clumps or shredding by kelvin helmholtz instabilities. That's our sixth dimensionless number, which is basically the time scale for this gravitational instability normalized by the, shear, by the shearing. Um, time scale, and this is work by Yale graduate student Han, Han Ong, uh, at low, uh, basically, mass per unit lengths, when uh, the kelvin helmholtz should, should win, you see that the weak gravity case looks like the no gravity uh, case, except the central core of the stream survives for significantly longer, because it's stabilized by actually, um, due to buoyancy forces within the stream, uh, which uh, are basically parameterized by this Richardson uh, n number here. But uh, at more massive streams, still mu uh, smaller than one, so we can begin in hydrostatic equilibrium, but above the critical value, so gravitational instability is stronger than kelvin helmholtz instability, you actually do form discrete clumps um, in the stream, which while they're not self-gravitating in this case, they are actually pressure confined. When you include cooling, these can become gravitationally unstable uh, and star forming and will certainly affect uh, turbulence generation in the, in the disk itself. Uh, I'll skip MHD just to, we can talk about this in the discussion if we wish, just to mention that this is, of course, a seventh dimensionless number, the plasma beta parameter. 
<laughs> so just to summarize, um, cylindrical streams are kind of an intermediate case between planar shear layers and spherical clouds. There's a lot of very rich and um, in, in, um, interesting physics. For the pure hydro case, sufficiently narrow streams can disrupt in the CGM due to Kelvin-Helmholtz instability. However, once you add either cooling or self-gravity or MHD, assuming still laminar flow for your initial conditions, cold streams do survive and they do reach the central galaxy. It's very difficult to get them to be completely destroyed in the CGM. Uh, cooling will lead to um, mass entrainment plus mixing, might explain, help explain Lyman alpha blobs and has some interesting implications for collisionally ionized oxygen-6 in uh, I I I interface layers. Self-gravity can lead to stream fragmentation and star formation in streams, which may be important for the formation of globular clusters at high redshift. Um, MHD, which I didn't uh, talk about, might actually lead to magnetically dominated shear layers between the stream and the background. Uh, and kind of the big open question is what happens when you combine cooling and self-gravity and MHD and the halo potential? Can we come up with a, a description for the evolution of streams as a function of these now seven dimensionless numbers that we've talked about throughout the talk? And uh, what would happen if the CGM itself were actually very turbulent and has strong shocks due to the virial accretion shock or galactic outflows, which are interacting with the wind and again, decidedly non-laminar initial conditions. Uh, and I think I'll end there. And, Happy to discuss uh, anything else. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it, that was already very instructive and we're gonna have a bunch of discussion time. Um, people can raise their hands in the chat and they can also, I see some questions appearing in Halo 21 V6 inflows. Uh, and and there was the first person to have his hand up was Todd Tripp. And I noticed in the chat, I, I counted, there's a comment with 15 exclamation points in one line of text. So it looks pretty urgent, Todd. <laughs> Very well. Yes. Uh, I will bring that slide back. So this is from uh, a recent paper by yeah, Clayton uh, Strano. Oh, sorry. Maybe I can I ask course. my question first? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, I'll, I'll <laughs> comment. You can never have enough exclamation points. But <laughs> my question actually is seeking a clarification. It may be hard, but when you brought in the extra physics, it seemed to change that, you know, the micro gas physics seems to change the picture substantially. So at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned that, you know, in the cosmosims, you don't expect stream feeding except for in the most massive galaxies at redshift zero. So have you evaluated whether the, the additional gastrophysics <coughs> changes that to the point where, well, maybe, <laughs> at Z equals zero, you could have stream feeding because of these additional complications, even for lower mass galaxies. Right, so that's a great question. Um, so uh, these plots that I, I showed kind of a few times throughout where I've kind of tried to demarcate the different parameters of the streams as a function of halo mass and redshift, you'll notice that I never actually went below redshift one uh, or, or be, be, away from this 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 14. Uh, that was kind of deliberate. I was really focusing here on the more high redshift streams, which are feeding, you know, 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 13 solar mass halos at, at intermediate to high redshift. <laughs> at low redshift, where we do expect streams to be feeding uh, very massive clusters, the situation is a little different because we don't actually expect the streams to start out uh, outside the virial radius at cold uh, 10 to the 4 Kelvin um, um, temperatures. The streams themselves are already somewhat more hot. Turns out that they actually form an accretion shock uh, around them. That was something that uh, I didn't get, get into here, but uh, streams in the uh, in intergalactic medium also have hot accretion shocks around them. Just like, you know, your dark matter halos have spherical uh, accretion shocks uh, around them, and we expect the low mass halos to be able to, to cool and form a cold core at their center, whereas the high mass halos are likely to be all hot. The same is true for filaments. And once you get to the very massive, uh, in terms of their mass per unit length, the very massive uh, filaments, which are feeding the most massive clusters at low redshift, uh, they should be um, all, all kind of hot. So it's no longer a lot of this interesting physics where we talk about the strong cooling due to 10 to the four Kelvin, et cetera, and, and the streams being very you know, narrow and coherent sort of breaks down when you get to low redshift, very massive clusters, they're still a lot colder than the virial temperature of the uh, intracluster medium. So you're talking about, you know, 
a hundred thousand to a million Kelvin compared to a ten plus million Kelvin burial temperature. But but some of the details that I've been discussing, those would be basically a different regime of the parameter space, which which uh, I haven't uh, studied so explicitly so quite quite yet. But right. So so clusters are one thing, but what about lower mass halos at low redshift? Do you do you expect the same breakdown, or or could there be still cold streams at low redshift for for lower mass things um so that's that's a, a good question i i would argue if you're talking about the this situation where you have several separate large um, intergalactic filaments that are really coming on very large scales from discrete locations to penetrate the halo uh is probably not going on uh and for example a milky way mass halo at redshift zero or a lower mass halo at zero because those should be aligned along your you know like large scale filaments so because the milky way is basically at the press sector mass or smaller what you are very likely to have is that these individual filaments you know could have subfilaments in them or, 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 or smaller in, in the star formation community. They're sometimes referred to as like fiber bundles or filament bundles. So I do expect you would have some smaller scale uh, filamentary features that, that might be present in lower mass halos at, at low redshift, but that's not yet really been studied. And, and those are very poorly resolved in cosmological simulations. And, uh, their properties might be a little different from the kind of large prominent filaments that I'm describing. But it is a good question uh, and, and uh, worth of more study. Okay. So uh, it looks like uh, Mary Putman had a question in the Slack, which she now believes you have answered. <laughs> Would you expect star formation within cold streams feeding clusters at Z of zero? And she, after listening to she believes the answer is no. Is she correct about that? That, that would be my, uh, if, if I had to guess, I would say, yeah, I don't expect that likely to happen. Uh, in fact, in the, so I, I really only expect this. It, so if, if you, okay, I, I discussed the concept of streams becoming gravitationally unstable. The other thing you have to ask is what is the cooling time in the streams from 10 to the four down to, you know, 10 or a hundred Kelvin. For that, you have to make some assumptions about the metallicity of these streams. But it turns out that even if the streams are only enriched about 1% solar metallicity, um, the densities at high redshift are so high that above redshift 4 or so, the cooling time from 10 to the 4 down to 10 or 100 becomes uh, shorter than the virial crossing time. But that breaks down at lower Z. So even once you get to redshift 2, I think the densities are such that uh, you the, – you, the, the cooling would be the bottleneck from, from 10 to the 4 down. Okay. Uh, Max Granke has a question. Uh, yes, thanks a lot, Mir, for your, um, for your talk. Um, my, I was wondering about, um, you know, in this cartoon, you showed these, these opening angles, essentially, of these streams. How large are those in, in reality? And do you think, you know, basically heating or, you know, additional terms due to this compression um, affects the evolution. Thanks. Uh, no, that's a great question. That's actually something that we're studying. Uh, that we're studying now. Uh, so I, I don't. I don't have a plot here. But uh, what we're doing now is actually uh, together with uh, um, collaborators at at the CFA and um, uh, uh, Jerusalem and Yale. Um, we're simulating uh, a cold stream actually trying to penetrate a halo potential where we account for that. You know as you say, the change of the cross section. Um, analytically, I, I think it's reasonable to assume that uh, the same mass entrainment uh, scalings should be able to be applied locally at any given halocentric radius, given the cross section of the stream and the density of the, of the stream there. Uh, what we find when you actually inc include the halo potential, it kind of slightly messes up descriptions of uh, um, pressure equilibrium because the stream is traveling in so supersonically through a steep pressure gradient that if you have kind of, if you start out in pressure equilibrium, then by the time the stream has gotten further in, its pressure is now much lower compared to its uh, surroundings, but it hasn't had time to react yet because it's traveling so supersonically and that creates a bit of havoc and, and I don't really yet know the answer of what the net scaling is going to be, but but uh, that is under investigation. If if that answers your question, 
And how large are these uh, opening angles? Um, well, so if you believe these numbers where the kind of expectation for R stream divided by R veer to be, say, of order 10 or a few tens of a percent, um, whereas, um, so the, you basically expect the radius of the, of the you, so pure central gravity, if the stream is on a purely radial trajectory, uh, then you would almost form a perfect cone where um, that this R stream over R veer, that like ratio holds at any given halocentric radius. <laughs> In practice, the streams are not perfect cones, uh, are, are not on purely like radial um, orbits. They always have some non-zero uh, impact parameter. So the scaling is a little, you know, different, but, but I would say the first order, you can think of this as having uh, that, that same um, axis ratio at any given halocentric radius. So opening angles of a few tenths, you know, a few tenths or so. Okay. Um, Cameron. Uh, great talk, great tutorial, um, Nir. I just had a question you, you, you mentioned, and maybe I missed this, um, that a lot of the analysis that you, you provided here is, is based on um, these being laminar flows in their initial conditions. And, and I know at least in looking at the cosmological simulations and seeing these things flow, it, they look laminar, but I'm wondering if there's been formal analysis on, whether, on, on how turbulent it is and how the turbulence affects the overall progression of these things once they get into the virial halo. Yeah, no, that's, that's I, I think at this point, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, um, it, I, I would say that the next frontier of, of studies like this uh, is to include uh, turbulent uh, in, initial conditions in the ambient medium. Um, we expect turbulent Mach numbers to be, again, kind of of order Mach 1, perhaps slightly subsonic with respect to the hot halo. But again, that would imply with compared to the stream itself, highly supersonic motions in the background. <laughs> and it seems like that must affect the evolution uh, in, some, in, 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 in some way, either by kind of destroying the, the uh, clean entrainment of, coal, of additional mass onto the, onto the stream, or especially when we talk about um, M MHD, kind of a, a very you know, t t tangled uh, t turbulent magnetic field, is going to behave very differently compared to a laminar magnetic field in, in terms of uh, you know flux freezing and magnetic uh, am amplification, et cetera. So, I agree. It's 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 unclear exactly what the net effect of turbulence are going to be. If I had to guess, why some cosmological simulations still suggest streams being destroyed in the inner halo in certain cases. <laughs> If I don't just want to blame the resolution, and, and, and I think that might be a, a bit too easy of a solution, I would say that um, it might be highly turbulent uh, like motions in the inner CGM that, that, that the stream can't handle. But uh, Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That makes sense. And th there's been some interesting work recently by, um, I think the first author is Bananda Baragan, uh, trying to study what would effectively amount to the cloud crushing problem, but not of a single cloud, but of a, a turbulent cloud complex. And, and there've been a few other uh, re re results. I think the Spar et al cloud crushing problem had a turbulent cloud set up. And I think there's kind of slowly moving in the community of, of redoing all these idealized simulations, cloud crushing, stream stability, et cetera, in more turbulent initial conditions. And, and I think that's kind of the way we all have to go. So. So I have a, I, I, there's a related questions on my mind, might as well ask it now, which is, uh, of course, it's very interesting to understand uh, the idealized problem of a, of a cylindrical flow. Uh, and we know that instabilities develop. Um, but of course, uh, you know, a filament isn't going to be perfectly cylindrical as it falls in. There are going to be uh, pre-existing irregularities that could be quite significant. And, uh, and and so the two, the kind of two sides of it is are there reasons to believe that the stream can be self collimating <laughs> in other words that the, the conditions of you know irregular inflow it, because you have wakes and such things lead to some self collimation mm -hmm. or uh, could it be that starting with uh, you know kind of nonlinear irregularities in the stream to begin with. Um, 
could lead to significantly different results. Um, right. Well, so it's an interesting question. I would say so long as you're simulating the stream kind of in a periodic box, um, you could input the initial perturbations as irregularities in the shape of the stream. And, and that, that is something that we've experimented with. That, in terms of the nonlinear saturation of all the effects, <laughs> that's equivalent to inducing a linear perturbation in your, like, velocity or, or in anything. So even if you drastically perturb the shape of the stream some, somehow, as long as you assume kind of a periodic flow and you, you allow infinite time for the instability to uh, progress, that doesn't make any difference. When you have the finite flow within the halo where, where the, there's a finite uh, end, so you're not looking at how instabilities grow with time, but how they grow with flow with kind of a spatial scale, um, there does seem to be more dependence on how you initiate the perturbations and how large you make them, because there's only a finite time any given perturbation will grow. So I, my, my yeah, I, I don't, have a good answer to to how everything would be affected in terms of self collimation i would think at least when you account for self gravity the, i would I, and I, I think that that to me was was one of the most remarkable realizations of these streams is how so many of them uh, are likely to be so close to self gravitating and and in that case i think you'd be hard pressed to severely perturb the shape of the stream um with with, with you know without it self-correcting itself due to, due to gravity. But, uh, but that does remain to be further studied. Okay. Um, Nicholas. Hi, hi Nia. Uh, I had a question that is also a plug in at the same time. The question is in the filaments, sometimes the focus is on the massive halos where the filaments connect, but between halos where you have these, these strings of galaxies as you showed in one of your first slides. What is, what is the typical mass um, of galaxies in the filaments be, on scales of a, a megaparsec between the massive halos? Because there's been a recent observation with the MUSE extremely deep field at um, 140 hours on a single deep pointing of MUSE where people are now starting to see diffuse emission between laminophile hair emitters, um, which is, might constrain these these moments right um so <laughs> to to first order i i would say you kind of um, expect any like typical halo of, of order whatever the press sector mass is at that redshift um down toward you know smaller scales um of course a, a higher order uh, answer would have to take into account uh, clustering and the two-point correlation function of different uh, different masses. That's something uh, that would be very uh, interesting to to do. Kind of two-point correlation statistics along filaments versus um, basically not not along filaments. Um, so I, I don't have the the direct answer to that at the moment. But I would right. say depending on the like redshift, I would expect anything of a typical halo mass, typical L star galaxy at that redshift or smaller to 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 find them along the filaments. These are redshift three, and the, the the galaxies that are in the filaments tend to have very small mass, ten to the eighty percent. So by redshift three, I would. Say, I mean, it wouldn't surprise you the most massive halo you found along there would have a virial mass of 10 to the 11, um, some, something like that. So that might not be too inconsistent with the numbers that you're saying. Maybe a little high, but, but those would be the most massive ones, I would think. Okay. Thanks. Uh, there's a question that in, the, in the Slack from Jake Bennett. How might feedback like an EGN shock wave impact the streams as they infall? Would it destroy them? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, turbulence a few moments ago as being the great unknown yet of, of, of this industry. I would think that the other great unknown is interaction with strong shocks uh, due to either galactic uh, feedback uh, or just the stream actually having to pass through the virial shock uh, in, in, the, in the first place. Now, interaction with AGN winds, et cetera, I suppose it depends who you ask. Uh, some would, would say, and we've heard a lot about this, that you expect the uh, inflows to be kind of along the major axis in the plane of the disk, whereas you expect the strong outflows to be more of a more of a biconical shape. So I don't think it, there would be unanimous agreement about whether or not the winds should actually run into the streams or not. <laughs> 
certainly plausible that they might, in, in which case uh, it, it would have to be studied how the in interaction of the stream plowing through such a strong shock uh, would, would actually work. And, and Jake, as long as uh, I was answering your question, your great paper, uh, and as I mentioned on the, on the Slack, where you have the uh, trajectories of inflowing streams through the virial shock, I would think would be a very similar uh, question. So it might be that streams are going to find kind of low Mach number holes in, in any kind of shock uh, or, or wind and maybe make it through, through there, but that should be studied further. Okay, uh, next hand up was Abishai. Uh, just to relate to what Mark was asking and what Neil just said, I want to remind you that the origin of the streams is the cosmic web and the shape and how narrow they are is starting by some processes that make them in the cosmic web on top of the dark matter filaments. So it's a very interesting question by itself. What happens before they cross the real shock and become, and everything that Neil said about what's happening in the hot CGM. Uh, we have to first understand what's going on and how they become so narrow and straight. As you saw them in the first slide, I think that you showed, which was a very large scale filament in the IGM, which was already narrow and pretty straight, pretty, pretty cylindrical. Thank you. Um, so Crystal has both a question in Slack and her hand up. I, I wonder if it's the same one. Indeed it is. Um, so I, I put a picture in Slack of one of these head-tailed dwarf galaxies, sometimes called cometary um, galaxies, where there's a little dwarf and there's like a big star-forming region on one end. And th these regions tend to have low gas phase metallicities compared to the rest of the galaxy. So you know, it's, it's pretty clear it's due to some sort of accretion. And, you know, perhaps a satellite has been accreted, but you, you got to find the, the evidence for, for the interaction, right? And something has to have dumped, you know, 10 to the 7 solar masses of gas and have kind of undetectable stars in it if it's a satellite. So there's been some papers written pointing to these things saying, you know, these are cold streams hitting dwarf galaxies at, at Z of zero. These galaxies are very rare, you know, in, in, the, in the local universe. But is this, it, it sounds like, you know, from the theoretical expectations, cold flows could be completely ruled out for these objects. Or, or if they could be proven for these objects, it would completely derail the theory. So, so how tight is this, okay? Well, I mean, I'll say, uh... I guess two, at least two things, maybe three, but two, two things. Uh, one, the, the kind of hard limit on the mass, I said, you know, have to be like a two sigma peak or, or, or to be stream fed. That, that's not a hard like limit. I mean, in principle, depending on the local environment, especially if you're talking about um, small galaxies that are in otherwise voids, there could be local small scale filaments, um, you know, because perhaps like locally that, that galaxy is the most massive thing anywhere near it in which case it would be at the node and be fed by perhaps smaller, more narrow filaments. So that, that certainly is quite possible. Uh, but the, the other aspect is, and, and this kind of came up a little bit yesterday in the discussion, I think it, it's a little hard in our, in, in our discussion to really differentiate the, the thin, like narrow cold streams that are connected, as I wish I said, to these intergalactic filaments to just, as I think Jonathan will tell us in the next talk, uh, you know, c c cooling flows that occur as a result of more um, um, isotropic uh, spherical accretion. And, and then due to slower processes such as, you know, the cooling and, and gas being supported by some net angular uh, um, mo momentum that they do cool and flow toward the center. So <clears throat> I think it's interesting to try and think about what the telltale signatures of one versus the other would be, so that we can see if, if there's any change in, observationally in, in, in what we infer the main mode of accretion to be in the galaxies such as your, uh, you just showed versus much more massive ones at high redshift. I would think more in the terms of a, of a cooling flow than a cold stream, but, but that's not to say we can rule out cold streams uh, 100%. Okay. Well, there's been a convenient lull in the questioning 
uh, two minutes before the hour. <laughs> so I think we'll take a five minute break here and have Jonathan start at three minutes after the hour. So those of us who need a break can take it. Um, and in discussion following Jonathan's talk, uh, we'll have cooling flow questions, but uh, <laughs> after a while, you know, the can, we can talk about any mode of, of, of accretion. So let's all take a break. See you three minutes after the hour. And thank you again, Nir. That was excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs>